Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the annual gala end of year Emeriti Association do um, our annual meeting that caps the end of a very active and um, uh, fairly successful year in uh, my estimation. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Steven Adler. I am the president for the next hour or less uh, of the Emeriti Association. I will soon be handing the cyber gavel over to my uh, successor, uh, but that is yet to be revealed. Uh, in the meantime, welcome everyone. I would like to remind you A, that this uh, entire session is being recorded and B, uh, everybody should be muted. Uh, we're muting everybody upon entry. So please keep yourself muted until such time as you will um, be asked to make a remark, uh, make a statement or have a question, excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. So without further ado, um, I would like to uh, launch in to uh, some announcements uh, before we get to the uh, most important part of our program underway, um, which uh, comprises uh, two sections or three sections, the uh, presentation of the new uh, executive committee and officers, the uh, awards, the uh, uh, revelation of the annual Dixon Awards, and of course, the highlight our guest speaker today. Um, I would just like to fill you in on a couple of highlights from what we have accomplished in the Emeriti Association this year. And of course, when I say we, I really mean we. It's been a collective effort. Uh, so many Emeriti have participated, uh, I think, with real delight and gusto and enthusiasm, despite the fact that we're still laboring under um, mostly uh, remote conditions and uh, we continue to do our work uh, largely on Zoom, uh, but we have still accomplished a fair amount. And I'm very proud of what we have accomplished. I would like to say, of course, first and foremost, that we couldn't have accomplished anything without the uh, remarkable uh, guidance and wisdom of our indefatigable uh, director and leader of our the Retirement Resource Center, Suzanne Chaffee, who, uh, guides both the EA and the Retirement Association, a uh, really extraordinary leadership. Um, so thank you, Suzanne. And of course, Vanya Bailan, who uh, is also equally uh, uh, marvelous in her role as uh, the right uh, hand to everything that uh, Suzanne uh, does and, uh, and runs beautifully and with great passion and, and conviction. <clears throat> Uh, the Chancellor Scholars Program and the Emeritime Mentor Program. Vanya does a remarkable job with that. So thank you also, Vanya. So moving on, um, just some capping some highlights uh, of what we've accomplished during the year. Um, I would like to note that uh, even though we've continued to add members to the Emeritai Association, uh, sadly, uh, attrition, uh, whether from uh, uh, death or other circumstances, has kept our membership about uh, pretty static. Uh, current membership of the EA sits at about 550 members. Uh, the Retirement Association, of course, has a much larger membership and is actually the largest in the UC system. Um, we continue as we are today, the last of the series, off, we continue to offer a monthly academic seminar via Zoom. Uh, our speakers largely uh, come from uh, current, sometimes retired uh, uh, UCSD faculty or uh, <clears throat> adjuncts. And of course, they're open to all Emeriti uh, members as well as to current faculty uh, and academics uh, and UCSD uh, retirement association members. Um, and sometimes we get uh, two to 300 people eventually watching the uh, lecture. Uh, today, we already have over 30 people logged on, more will come on, but the numbers will multiply uh, by a considerable factor once everybody uh, has viewed it, uh, today's uh, proceedings on uh, the Retirement Association YouTube channel. 
where so many of these lectures are housed. Um, and I would, of course, uh, be remiss if I didn't mention that the Retirement Association YouTube channel has at least 145 programs from uh, emeriti lectures, current faculty lectures, um, all sorts of seminars and workshops and presentations. It's a remarkable repository of uh, goodies that I think people should definitely take, uh, take a gander at if you haven't already done so. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the chambers in the beating heart of the Emeriti Association is our work uh, via the Emeriti Mentor Program uh, with our Chancellor Scholars Program. There's a lot of information about this very important program on uh, our website. Uh, it, suffice it to say that under this year's leadership of Ann Craig and uh, the baton will be taken up next year uh, by Mae Brown. Um, the Chancellor Scholars Program's Emeriti Mentors Program pairs these really terrific uh, students who come in as Chancellor Scholars. Uh, they're paired with uh, Emeriti Mentors and um, they participate in, in ongoing rigorous workshops and uh, seminars the students do uh, and ongoing mentorship with uh, their mentors sometimes that last way beyond their graduation from UCSD. <clears throat> it's a way to forge wonderful relationships and the students really are very grateful, I know, for the mentorship that they receive from the Emeriti. Um, data shows an average GPA of 3.4 to 3.5 for the students in that program relative to the roughly 3.0 to 3.1 uh, GPA of all UCSD students. So clearly uh, the 45 mentors in, uh, from the Emeriti Mentorship Program are doing something right vis-a-vis uh, -vis those students in the program whom we mentor. And I would heartily encourage anybody out there who would like to mentor a student to contact Suzanne or Vanya Bailon uh, or Ann Craig or Mae Brown for uh, looking towards next year's pairings. We typically take about 40 students into the program each year and we are always looking for more mentors. It's a very rewarding aspect of membership in the Emeriti Association. <laughs> um, two other highlights of uh, the, the Emeriti Association are uh, our book club, which is uh, uh, very active. Um, I believe Roger Sprague is still uh, overseeing that, but it's, it uh, draws participants from all uh, aspects of uh, all divisions, uh, all academic backgrounds within the EA and some uh, RA affiliates as well. And uh, it's being conducted on Zoom now. If you have interest in participating in the book club, send Roger Sprague a note. Uh, or Suzanne Chaffee, and we will connect you with that. Um, there is, of course, also um, the Chronicles, which is the quarterly newsletter uh, currently edited by Sandy Lakoff, um, <clears throat> which features articles written largely by Emeriti, but sometimes we ask others uh, on campus or beyond to contribute. Um, I had a great time writing a two-part uh, article on the history of La Jolla Playhouse uh, last year. And we feature articles about the history of the campus, about uh, programs and opportunities on campus, uh, writ both large and small. So if you uh, certainly, if you're not receiving the Chronicles, make sure that you let us know. And if you have any interest in writing something for Chronicles, please, of course, also let Sandy Lakoff or me or Suzanne Chaffee know and be happy to talk to you about having an article uh, in Chronicles. Um, and uh, of course, check out our website, um, emeriti.ucsd.edu. If you're not familiar with it, uh, please bookmark it because that's also a repository of so much of what I've just talked about. So I think that's the long and the short of what has, uh, what needs to be uh, disseminated here today as far as announcements. Again, it's been um, 
I, I will just say a real privilege and honor uh, to be uh, in the uh, wearing the crown this year, but the crown weighs heavy. And I would be uh, more than happy to pass it off uh, to the next monarch uh, momentarily. And again, I want to personally thank all my colleagues in the executive committee, um, our, our past presidents, uh, both Jake Jacoby last year and Bob Knox the year before, who helped me through all of this, my vice president, Ellen McCutcheon, and all the members of the uh, executive committee, Ann Craig, with the Chancellor Scholars and the Maritime Mentors Program and others. Thank you for everything, Phyllis Mirsky, our uh, Kim Senore Parr. I'm looking at all the faces on the Joe Watson and many others, Bernard Minster, uh, whom you'll hear from shortly, and other colleagues and friends. Thank you. Um, so um, I think at this moment in time, um, it's time for me to um, introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Emeritus from uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, Jean Bernard Minster, who will tell you about the presentation of our Dixon Awards. So Bernard, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, well, uh, I have a, a suggestion for new members. If you ever want to help serve the association in one form or another, and you can find yourself a, a position on your awards committee, pick it immediately, choose it. I am sure that Joe Watson and uh, Roger Sprague would agree with me. This is one of the best services you, you can have on, uh, on, on the association. Uh, this year, the committee, that's the three of us, uh, uh, recommended and got secured two awards for the Dixon Award. Dixon Award uh, was created about 50 years ago by UC Regent Edward Dixon. And uh, uh, right now, uh, it, it uh, is split among campuses, and each campuses can nominate uh, at least one or maybe two uh, awards. Uh, the stipulation is that the earnings from this endowment would stimulate and recognize the Maritai for their continuing service, teaching, and research. Uh, this year, we had uh, some very good nominations and we had a very easy time selecting them. Uh, the first one is Jade Jacoby. Uh, and uh, most of us, all of us know Jake, or have known Jake. And I looked at his resume and I tried to see, you know, there's no way I can summarize this. However, one of the nomination letters from uh, uh, David Gus, who's also an emergency, uh, an emeritus professor, uh, did the job for me. And uh, Jake has continued a broad range of academic pursuits, having authored numerous articles, abstracts, and book chapters since he retired in 2010. That's 12 years ago. He's an active reviewer for the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine, the Journal of Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine, that's pretty specialized, and the Journal of Emergency Medicine. Uh, Jake is also often invited as a speaker to a broad variety of local, national, and international forums. He maintains a broad specific certification in internal medicine, infectious disease, emergency medicine, and hyperbaric medicine. Now, in terms of his service on, uh, on the association, uh, uh, he's been a longstanding active member of the association, serving a vice president and president. He is now immediate past president for, I think, another hour, less half an hour. And is the chair of the nominating committee and has been the chancellor's mentor since 2014. Uh, I, I am delighted to present to you Jake Jacoby, 
as a recipient of this year's Dixon Award for UCSD. Jay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Uh, I do wanna take this opportunity to thank the Emeriti Association and the awards committee for selecting me for this. Uh, Edward Dixon Emeriti Professorship Award for continued teaching and service. I, of course, must thank uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Dr. David Gus, former director of the Department of Emergency Medicine for his support and allowing me to continue my involvement at the federal level while working in the department with the National Disaster Medical System for the team which I started in 1991 and uh, my involvement continues even today. 12 years after my retirement. Uh, since 2010, I've led my disaster team on deployments for Superstorm Sandy in New York City, for Hurricane Harvey in Houston, and for COVID-19 missions in the last uh, two, two and a half years since the beginning of the pandemic. It is indeed a great honor to be selected, considering the tremendous output of the Emeriti professors at UCSD. Many of you who are, are making considerable contributions to the university on an outgoing, on an ongoing basis. I've been honored to be part of the Emeriti Association for a number of years. I thank Suzanne Chaffee and the entire association for all the opportunities that have come my way. Thank you again for this award. Uh, it is so much appreciated. Congratulations, Jake. Thank you. The awards committee uh, nominated and uh, successfully the uh, second uh, uh, recipient of the award, the Dixon Award from UCSD. And that's Barbara Sorry. And uh, again, all of you know Barbara, I've known her for many years. Uh, she had the stellar uh, nomination. Unfortunately, she had the long standing obligation to be out of town all week. And uh, this award will be the object of a special uh, uh, situation uh, in the fall meeting. So if you want to drop a note to Barbara and congratulate her, please do so. Uh, but uh, you'll have a much better chance of doing that in the fall, maybe in person. Thank you very much. Stephen, back to you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you, members of the committee, for uh, the work, because it's a lot of work. We had a lot of nominations and reviewing these impressive uh, CVs and letters of support is not uh, insignificant. And I would like to add my sincere congratulations to the two deserving recipients and friends, Jake, Jacoby, and Barbara Sari. Uh, again, congratulations. Um, all right, speaking of Jake Jacoby, um, I think that uh, you, my friend, are up as uh, chair of the uh, Emeriti Association Nominating Committee to uh, present your report and the new slate of officers and um, members at large. Um, and uh, would you like to uh, you know, get out the manual and install us or install them, Jake? Sure, thanks a lot, Stephen. Uh, first, I would like to uh, recognize those members of the executive committee who are retiring at the end of this year and thank them for their service. And those are uh, Kim Signore Parr, John Goodkin, Richard Madsen, and Roger Spratt. They have uh, been on the executive committee for varying numbers of uh, times and uh, we truly appreciate their service. The uh, slate was um, selected through careful interviews and agreements of, uh, with the folks that uh, were recognized as uh, valuable members of the Emeriti Association. And I should emphasize that the uh, members on the slate, uh, and the slate was approved by electronic voting uh, over the last two months. 
the new officer, the new president uh, from Health Sciences, Alan McCutcheon. Um, I'm wondering if we could uh, actually post those names while I speak. Uh, the new vice president from campus is uh, Peter Gurevich. The new secretary treasurer from Health Sciences is Gail Liu. And the past president from campus from the theater department is in fact, Stephen Adler. Um, the members at large for three-year terms are Joe Watson, who is now in his second year, self uh, in the third year term that I took over, Jean-Bernard Minster, who's in his second year, Poland is in his first year from Health Sciences, Mark Paddock is new in his first year as a member at large from campus, and Duncan Agnew is the first year of his three-year term from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, in addition to the primary members of the executive committee, we have ex officio members for the year, including Sandy Lakoff, who's the editor of Chronicles, May Brown, who's the chair of the Maritime Interprogram, Howard Kushner is the new historian from campus, Suzanne Chaffee, is the director of the Retirement Resource Center. May Brown is liaison the UCSD Retirement Association. Phyllis Mursky is the secretary of CUSIA. And Harry Pohl is the CUSIA representative. Uh, these are the, your new officers for 2022-2023. And um, you are now officially all installed. Thank you. Great, Back Jake. Thank you. Steven. Thank you. Well, um, if we were alive, I would uh, make an official handoff and presentation uh, to Alan. I do not have a gavel, uh, unfortunately. I do have this nice claw hammer um, that I can pass over to you, Alan, uh, instead of in lieu of a gavel. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Jake. Thanks, everybody. Harry, it's good to see you also, of course, a good friend and, and colleague and if anybody whose name I didn't mention. But Alan and Peter, it's your baby now. So uh, I pass the baton and the hammer over to you. Alan, you want to unmute yourself, please? Thank you. I. I Appreciate um, the hammer, that uh, may be useful. Our, our main attraction then uh, is uh, um, Peter Howey, who is uh, a professor of political science and Dean Emeritus of our uh, School of Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, Peter was educated at Georgetown where he earned a BS degree in foreign service in 1970 following which he got an MA and PhD in political science at UC Berkeley. He joined our faculty in 1976 and has just retired in 2021. He's held a number of important positions at UCSD, Dean of the School of Global Policy and Health and Qualcomm Endowed Chair in Communications and Technology Policy uh, those positions from 2003 to 2021. He was special advisor to the chancellor from 2017 to 19 and interim executive vice president for academic affairs uh, from 16 to 17. He served in a number of advisory uh, positions to our federal government uh, from uh, 2011 to 2016 as chair and member of the U.S. Experts Group uh, China and Innovative Dialogue, uh, which is part of the strategic and economic dialogue of the Chinese and U.S. governments. From 2009 to 2010, he was a senior counselor to the U.S. Trade Representative Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. And he has co uh, he co-chaired uh, President Obama's uh, transition team uh, for trade policy 
uh, in 2008-2009. He's written six books, uh, the most recent of which he co-authored with uh, Jonathan Aronson, who, uh, and it is entitled Digital DNA, Disruption and Challenges for Global Government, Governance, uh, published by Oxford University Press. His most recent journal article on the same topic, again, co-authored with Jonathan Aronson, uh, was Digital Trade and Regulation in an Age of Disruption uh, in the Journal of International Law and Foreign Relations. I look forward to Peter's lecture today on a topic of immense immediate interest to us all, cybersecurity and the Ukrainian war. Peter? Well, thanks very much, Alan, and thanks to all of you for uh, taking the time to listen to me today. Um, I probably should do, uh, in honor of Peter Gervich, uh, a, a slight uh, correction on the introduction. It would be a surprise to the chancellor and to Peter, as well as me, if there was a school of global policy and health. Uh, it is the school of global policy and strategy. But I did have the honor of uh, being a successor to Peter as the founding dean, where I served as dean for 19 years. What I'd like to do today is to really draw on a combination of uh, uh, experience and academic research, uh, in addition to uh, the digital uh, policy scholarship I've done. As Alan mentioned, I've been fortunate enough to serve in government. And maybe the place to start in talking about cybersecurity was in a government position that uh, Alan didn't mention, which was that in 1994 to 1997, uh, I was uh, charged with uh, overseeing policy and regulation for the United States of all of its global communications and satellite networks. This was my introduction to the black box of uh, cyber intelligence. Uh, and to give you a sense of uh, the fact that chaos applies to every part of uh, the cyber world. My first experience really into the black box was when I was read into uh, what was called a code word uh, briefing uh, and clearance beyond top secret. A group of us were gathered together in an anonymous conference room in Northern Virginia with no distinguished markings. None of us knew each other. There were maybe six or seven of us. And um, part of the security briefing, uh, you had signed all of your uh, uh, pledges of protecting all the rules and comp conditions of access to this uh, pretty rarefied intelligence, was that you may never uh, even mention the code word that you had access to in the particular meeting. So we all come in, none of us know each other. We're gathered in this room that is totally anonymous and none of us can tell each other why we were there or what code word was involved. Uh, and it turned out the briefer was late. So we were all sitting there for 20 minutes wondering what was going on when finally he came in and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I got a little confused myself. And that in itself is a little bit of a hint about the first of two warnings I'm going to give you about everything else I'm going to say today. Uh, it is, of course, quite famous to say that there is a fog of war due to the chaos of combat. But the point of cyber uh, war and conflict is to create and live in that fog. So there is a level of uncertainty and shading of information that makes it hard to jump to conclusions based on what we see even in the best reported press. So everything I'm gonna to say to you is my best judgment of what we can read between the lines and some of what was op openly reported, but we should be very cautious about this. Second of all, uh, I wanna note that the particular uh, characteristic of cyber conflict as we're living through it as a policy matter is that it is new in many ways, but it is also not totally new. Uh, a lot of the confusion 
and the debate and discussion about cyber conflict and cyber security comes from the fact that cyber is in fact a blanket for a number of very discreetly different things, all linked by cyber technology, but really different challenges. And although cyber itself as a technology and a total experience is new, the roots of it in these particular domains all have long historic precedents that can inform us in interpreting this new novel experience. So when we talk about cybersecurity and cyber war, we often conflate several different points. Cyber is a source of misinformation called propaganda, if you would. Cyber as crime, which often looks like it's an armed attack. Cyber as reconnaissance, intelligence, and spying which are not the same thing as cyber war per se, and we're not the same in classic kinetic war. Sabotage, of course, is yet another area. And finally, what is called in the jargon kinetic damage. That is you use cyber means to blow something up, right? So all those are separate strands. They all have ample precedent in the world prior to cyber, but they should not be treated as one thing. They each have their own distinct characteristics and logic to them. So with those two notions in front of you that you shouldn't trust anything in the fog of cyber conflict totally, and you're dealing with an area that's novel, but also has ample precedent in all of its specifics, I wanna to turn to what we can uh, ascertain from the Ukraine war as it's evolved so far. I'm gonna do that uh, as concisely as I can so I can allow for more time for questions uh, and comments from all of you. So I'm gonna start by just simply saying that this conflict is like all forms of sustained high level conflict. It usually in these situations produces changes both in strategic military doctrine and it produces changes in the relationship between the public sector and the private sector in authority relationships. Those two characteristics are pretty common to almost any major conflict that we've seen in recorded history. And it's important to keep that in mind as we sort through the details that we're going to be looking at. So as I said, cyber conflict is new enough and it's different enough that we don't have vast experience with it in its novel aspects. And that means that there is um, a difficulty in looking to prior conflicts for, if you would, one-to-one -one mapping onto the cyber space. We can get lots of ideas from prior conflict situations but we have to be respecting what's novel and strange about cyber. So as we do that, as an example, to sort of get your head around this, think about uh, the whole notion of cyber war in itself. There is a very serious debate in the realm of the military and civilian oversight authorities about what is cyber war and Therefore, how do the rules of war apply to cyber conflict? Now, it's true that the rules of war are often broken in fact in day-to-day -day activity, but nonetheless, professional militaries of a certain level of competence actually do train and take attention to the rules of war. And some of them make sense because they have a lot to do with ensuring long-term national interests within some sort of norms about how conflict should be played out. So for example, we have military uh, norms that military action and reprisals and retaliation should be proportionate to the damage received. And that that is actually something that countries can be held accountable for, at least at the diplomatic level. And we have in the rule laws of war, 
some notions about things that are off limits to military attack. Think of Red Cross facilities in war zones, all right? So the rules of war have evolved over hundreds of years because there are some logical reasons out of self-interest, and there is some degree to which it has been infused by broader values, if you would, in global society. Do those apply to cyber conflict? Interestingly enough, the professional military, uh, at least in the United States and the NATO allies, have argued that they should and that we'd all be better off if they did. And interestingly enough, even Russia and China have in prior times signed on to broadly stated diplomatic declarations that this should be pursued as a goal to figure out how to make these applications. And so this illustrates again, this relationship that prior experience in the, if you would, analog world can help us understand some things about the digital world, but the relationship is still being charted out. So I'm gonna to talk today about four ways in which the Ukraine uh, experience has been changing our thinking about strategic doctrine for conflict and diplomacy related to that conflict. And then two ways in which it's changed our understanding of the relationship between public authority and the private sector. Let's turn first to the idea of how the experience has been changing our thinking about strategic doctrine. Take you back um, even five, eight, 10 years ago. Um, and at the time, uh, there was huge uh, levels of uncertainty and dispute about exactly how classic notions of deterrence, strategic uh, doctrine for military use of force, and diplomacy to complement uh, deterrence should apply in the cyberspace. The first reason for that, of course, was that the cyberspace in a sense is designed not to be very transparent, that fog of war element I referred to earlier. But if you went back to the time of coming out of the Obama administration, for example, there were uh, examples both in the serious think tank world uh, and in the popular uh, culture of the notion that cyber was especially dangerous because it opened the way to a new form of Pearl Harbor attacks. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are unfortunate enough to see Die Hard 4, the last of the Bruce Willis thriller movies uh, in that series, the plot was based upon the idea of a Pearl Harbor type of cyber attack on the United States. This idea uh, was seemingly uh, plausible because the idea was that cyber offense had huge advantages over cyber defenses. And it could be launched by any number of actors, not just a China or a Russia, but by terrorists as well. This idea then became uh, the first place that there was a lot of attention and time spent. But experience since then, uh, and particularly the experience of the Ukraine war, uh, have led to a steady decline of popularity of the Pearl Harbor uh, scenario uh, for cyber and conflict. But let me try to explain why because it'll help you understand some of the dynamics that we've been observing in the Ukraine conflict. I'll start simply by noting that um, the first mystery uh, in popular discussion and among all of us who consider ourselves somewhat expert on cybersecurity uh, was why didn't Russia have uh, a knockout punch in the first stage of the Ukraine attack. 
Uh, Chris Inglis, who is the White House coordinator for cybersecurity, recently did uh, an on-the-record interview at the Council on Foreign Relations, where uh, his uh, uh, elegant summary of the understanding of this question in the US government was, we don't know. Um, but his second answer was, but we have guesses and some seem more probable than others. So let me take you through that logic. The first and still the most common uh, explanation for why Russia did not try to land an across the board cyber attack, disrupting the electric grid, the communications networks, part of the civilian infrastructure, certainly the government's command and control systems in the Ukraine and the rest, was that if done across the board at a high level, you could end up knocking out a large part of the vital day-to-day -day infrastructure of the Ukraine. And the Russians thought that they were going to have an easy, quick victory. And what you didn't want to do was conquer a territory and then discover that nothing worked and you'd have to do restoration. So better just to take the territory with limited disruption of the civilian infrastructure and then uh, uh, consolidate your control afterwards. So that notion uh, had some plausibility and it certainly may have been part of the Russian thinking, but there are other reasons for thinking that maybe that answer is a little too simple. And it goes to, again, the problem of the Pearl Harbor analogy. It turns out, of course, that the Russians did do a number of cyber attacks at the start of the war and since the start of the war. And they conformed to some of the things you would expect in a uh, Pearl Harbor scenario. For example, uh, on the first days of the Russian attacks in the Ukraine, uh, the Russians did attempt to launch a takedown of the Ukraine electric grid. Now, this was not a novel undertaking. In both 2015 and 2016, we know that the Russians took out and brought down part of the Ukrainian electric grid through cyber attacks. The damage was limited to particular regions and it only lasted for a few days, but it was a clear warning shot and demonstration by the Russians of their capabilities. This was not particularly surprising for a lot of reasons. Number one, electric grids are often old and uh, not well defended. Uh, so they're good targets from the viewpoint of a cyber attack. The second reason is that in fact, part of the Ukrainian electric grid still has a physical connection to the Russian electric grid. And therefore they could share some of the same, if you would, command and control software systems, which means that the Russians have a very deep reading into the Ukrainian system and therefore can tailor attacks against it uh, in very elegant ways. So that happened, but guess what? It didn't work. We also know that there was an attempt to take out the Ukrainian command and control system. That didn't work. We also have a rather high confidence in saying that the Russians did disrupt to a limited extent uh, a number of public communications uh, websites in an effort to use cyber as a source of misinformation for, if you would, shaping the public will in the Ukraine and making people think that uh, they were losing rapidly and should just surrender as quickly as possible. But all those attacks, even the ones that had some success, were rapidly contained and uh, limited in scope. Since then, there have been continuing efforts. Uh, here in San Diego, one of the world's largest satellite system providers uh, for communications is Viasat. Viasat happens to have a very large footprint in Eastern Europe for satellite services serving uh, sensitive government uh, facilities, including the military. Uh, and it also delivers much more mundane services such as satellite delivery of cable uh, TV network services. Uh, there was an attack, uh, which we are confident came from a Russian military unit. 
uh, on Viasat uh, systems affecting the Ukraine. Uh, and the way that they attacked it showed the way in which technical surprises can happen. They went after the modems that were connecting the satellite uh, uh, beams to the actual uh, application networks. And by disrupting the modems, they were able that, to disrupt service for a number of uses. But the thing that was equally interesting was that the disruption was very quickly spotted in its early inception and spread. And it was able to be contained and services restored with backup alternative facilities relatively rapidly. So there was a breakthrough, but the breakthrough was limited in its impact and shortened duration. All those factors suggest that there is more going on in the balance between offense and defense than the early Pearl Harbor scenario suggested. I'll go back to that in just a moment. Let me note a second factor about this story about a failure to have a Pearl, Pearl Harbor, which is there is now informed speculation, deeply veiled uh, under veils of secrecy, but we can guess some of what it's about, that in fact, the uh, Russian uh, attack vectors, the use of botnets, uh, for example, to take over clusters of computers on a network basis and then direct them to mischief, uh, has run into the fact that um, to attack these systems successfully in many cases requires uh, modes of attack that can spill over from the intended target in the Ukraine to related targets with similar systems in bordering states. And so if you're worried, as the Russians, despite their bluster, are about invoking a broader conflict with NATO of a more escalated form, you got to be careful about deploying some of these modes of attack. They are not perfectly targeted. There is spillover effect, and the spillover effect is something to worry about. Finally, of course, is the factor of retaliation. Um, for everything that the Russians could do to the Ukrainians, it is reasonable to expect that uh, the United States and the British in particular, but others as well, could do similar things to Russia. Um, a few years ago, I was involved in a closed think tank exercise uh, simulating a confrontation between the US and Russia on cyber conflict uh, with a number of the active military leadership of cyber command involved. Uh, and those of us who were supposedly representing the US civilian presidential cabinet uh, in the exercise at one point asked them military, um, can we send a signal to the Russians not to go any further that they can't miss and which they would have to take very seriously, but doesn't cause any kinetic, that is physical damage at this moment. Uh, and we gave them some other specifications. Um, their response was, hmm, well, this is a hypothetical only, you understand. It might not be how things would be in the real world. But imagine that we could send a signal to the command system of the entire Russian national electric grid saying, we're sitting there. Oh, we thought that was not a bad signal in itself. And of course, it implies certain things about US capabilities, whether in fact it would be the electric grid or water grid or natural gas pipelines, whatever it happens to be penetrative. So retaliation is still a factor as well that has to be considered. There is deterrence. But a larger conclusion about um, what's happened in the Ukraine is that at least for relatively sophisticated countries, the advantage of cyber offense over cyber defense 
is smaller than we thought 10 years ago. And that's because of hard work that has been done in understanding the types of cyber attacks and the defensive strategies, and then investing money and human capital training into defending systems. So let me say a word about that because it applies not just to the conflict in the Ukraine, but how we run cybersecurity at UCSD or any large institution in the United States today. Now, with varying degrees of competence and skill, it's true, but nonetheless, these are the fundamentals. The, the notion in cybersecurity has moved from the idea of you can stop all attacks if you're really good to the notion of there's no such thing as a foolproof system. You can reduce vulnerability to attacks, fend off large proportions of attacks, but the idea of absolute security is a fool's game. So the notion is now called risk management. And risk management begins with, if you would, the outer perimeter, trying to stop the easy penetration of your systems. You've all gone through the escalation in the login credentials that you have to go through to the UCSD network. That's a result of the fact that login attacks is one of, are one of the easiest forms of penetration of a network. And frankly, users like us shouldn't be trusted to be reliable and secure on MOS. Uh, the level of uh, number of people who still have low-level passwords, who don't uh, practice protection of passwords, et cetera, is terrible. Uh, coming down the pike, I should add to you in the next couple of years, is probably the elimination of passwords. Everything's probably going to be by fingerprint, biometrics, or other uh, techniques. But the first notion is harden the perimeter, but recognize it won't work. The second step is rapid detection. The degree to which systems could be penetrated and successfully penetrated without detection for a considerable period of time, opening the way to all sorts of mischief, short and long-term, was terrible 10 years ago. Detection is much better in sophisticated systems today. That's one of the things that happened in the Biosat attack. They spotted the problem early and were able to start containment. And containment is step number three. Systems are now based on, or will soon be based by, uh, on zero trust architectures, which means you trust nothing in the network. Everything is locked down and compartmentalized. Think of this like what you used to read about in spy networks, that anybody in the spy network only knew people in their compartment and no other compartment. That's how networks are being organized for managing functions and information today. And that means you can do containment faster. And finally, you have to have resilience. You invest in backup, redundant capabilities, ways of restoring functionality, at least at some core level, much more rapidly. And the faster you can, can reduce the period of disruption, the lower the incentive for the attack, because these attacks are based upon a type of cost benefit you know, type of analysis in most cases. So risk management has proven to be uh, a major step forward, reducing the vulnerability of networks while not eliminating it, and thus reducing the advantage of offense over defense. Now, it was often thought, that, well, the Ukraine is a relatively poor and badly organized uh, former Soviet state. What's it doing? But in fact, a number of those states have suffered from Soviet meddling, Russian meddling for so long that they have become pretty sophisticated at cyber security. And especially after 2015 and 16, the Ukraine invested a lot with the help of the US and the UK in particular in upgrading its cyber network defenses. So the third factor that uh, comes out of this is that it used to be thought in Pearl Harbor attacks that, oh, you wouldn't know who did it if it was some anonymous party or you couldn't prove it. You could suspect it, but you couldn't prove it. No longer the case. Attribution of attacks is not foolproof, but it's gotten to be much better. And in general, when you talk to the top cybersecurity officials, 
they will tell you that they are much more confident in their ability to show attribution of attacks. Uh, and therefore, uh, the notion that you're going to get terrorist groups or a cleverly hidden uh, Russian uh, army unit that you couldn't quite attribute it to, uh, they don't think is as dangerous today. So those factors have changed our thinking about the type of attacks we're going to face. What's also changed in strategic doctrine is our thinking about the way that, if you would, military strategy and diplomacy interact in cyber conflict. And I would describe this as an evolution from passive deterrence in the cyber security world to one of forward engagement, to use the military's current favorite buzz phrase. Let me talk about the passive deterrence for just a second. What that really said is have the ability to retaliate and the US and others have long had that capacity in the cyber realm. That's the deterrence part. But passive in the sense that you don't do much meddling in the opponent's uh, network beyond establishing your retaliatory capabilities. You stay quiet you observe, you protect your sources and methods uh, about what you know, how you know it, and the rest. And that notion of keeping your powder dry, staying quiet, walking lightly, was very much the way in which cyber was handled initially because of the worries that this was a tinderbox that could blow up and escalate at any given moment. But experience has led to this new notion of a strategy of forward engagement combined with strategic diplomacy. And let me uh, first start with forward engage, uh, engagement strategies. Basically, what the military doctrine now is saying and feels confirmed by the Ukraine experience to date is that US cyber capabilities should be actively engaged on a forward basis in the networks of likely attackers. This is not just to establish retaliatory capabilities, but to actively spot the development of potential attacks at an early stage, requiring much broader observation to do that. And if necessary, to sabotage those attacks as they are being formulated for attack. So this is a kind of a preemptive limited strike capability, obviously done very cautiously because it can get out of hand. And then that is combined with a new form of strategic diplomatic initiatives. And we've watched this strategy play out in the Ukraine and what I believe the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for. And let me show you how they've tried to do this. You will uh, recall that um, President Biden got up and declared in as large uh, uh, way as he could to the world and at the highest diplomatic military channels to our allies that Putin was going to launch an attack on the Ukraine. And the response was, well, that's maybe being alarmist. You know, maybe that's over the top. But what the president said is, I'm not saying he might, I'm saying they will. And there you had forward engagement and strategic diplomacy front and center. What Biden was doing, unlike passive deterrence, was saying to the Russians and to Putin personally, very clearly, we have penetrated your command and control system, and we are watching the orders that you are giving to your military units to prepare for the invasion. We know what you're doing. And we don't care that you know that we're in your command and control system. 
kick us out, we'll be back in. All right. So that was in itself uh, a real message to the military leadership of the Russians, separate from Putin. And it also established the credibility for Biden and his diplomatic team with the NATO allies to say, listen, as this starts to really play out in real life, uh, trust us, we are going to feed you reliable intelligence for guiding our collaboration inside NATO in responding to these matters. And in doing that, it opened the ground for the sort of confidence building that you've seen inside NATO for coordinated responses. Now, command and control systems are not some sleek single thing. So it may well be that at different moments, the US has different levels of access and observation of the command and control systems of Russia. But what it does mean is that we have the ability to do penetration and certainly at that moment, we were willing to expose our sources and means of intelligence in order to have an aggressive public diplomacy to rally political support for uh, our actions in NATO. So I think you're gonna find these doctrines being uh, further solidified in US strategic thinking and in our statecraft of diplomacy. Let me talk for just a couple of minutes about the other part of changes from major conflicts on features of uh, global society. And that's the changes in the relationship between public authority and the private sector. I'm gonna mention one just for fun, and then I wanna dwell on the other. The one just for fun is this. Uh, it's long been the case that uh, the Russian army, the Chinese army, et cetera, have military cybersecurity units that have done disruptive uh, uh, tactics in the United States and other uh, NATO countries or other allies in the United States. And they hold them at arm's length and they tried to hide the attribution, make it obscure. But as attribution got better, we're able to spot those arm's length units. And it's now common to see the US government issue criminal indictments against the individuals in those particular military cyber units in China and Russia, just to be able to limit their ability to freely travel around the world in light of these US indictments. So the issue then is, is there any other way that you can do arm's length attacks as a government, um, given the fact that using your own military units isn't working so well, even if you try to keep them in stealth mode. One thing that we know from history is that um, in the period of the global colonial empire's expansion in the 1600s and the 1700s, that the major powers chartered pirates, privateers who carried public commissions to wage war on behalf of the crown. Everybody did it, including the British. Queen Elizabeth paid off the national debt that she had when Drake essentially robbed the Spanish Arma, uh, gold armada one year. The capacity to do this then opens, if you would, authorized independent players who are acting under their own initiative and don't report and aren't under the command and control of detail of the governments that chartered them. Long, if you would, arm's length deniability for accountability. Right now, we are watching the Ukraine, it appears, I emphasize the fog of war here, to authorize a new generation of privateers on behalf of the Ukraine. They aren't part of the Ukraine military or the Ukrainian government, but they are encouraged and in a sense, semi-chartered by the Ukrainian government to go out and disrupt in Russia. The rise of a new generation of privateers would be an interesting development 
in the mixture of public and private control of the use of force. I'll just simply note that if it does happen at any extensive level, we'll come to the same moment that the European colonial powers eventually faced, which is that the privateers uh, start to become a double-edged sword, sufficient capability out of control to start disrupting their own internal operations. And they also, we got an international treaty against piracy that eventually was signed by all the colonial powers. So I would watch this space in uh, the time to come. Let me turn to the last point I wanna make about this change at, coming out of the Ukraine war, which is the relationship between government and business in cybersecurity. In reality, everybody in cybersecurity knows that the vast amount of transactions that are done digitally in the world are done by business. And in reality, the points of access and vulnerability in any country can never be really secure unless at least the larger uh, business establishments also are sharing in the cybersecurity effort. This has led to uh, considerable effort to build public-private partnerships, as they're ca called, to coordinate on cyber defense, but business for example, in the United States has resisted detailed government regulation of their cybersecurity efforts. The Ukraine war, as all wars do, has started to at least tilt this balance a little bit. The thing to note was that in the last couple of months, the FBI has gone to federal courts and received uh, warrants uh, or court orders to allow them to actually intervene in the networks of private companies without asking permission from the companies in order to remove botnets that were believed to be of Russian origin in those networks. A second sign of this is that Microsoft, which runs one of the world's most sophisticated cybersecurity uh, intrusion detection services because of its business interests, uh, has become much more open and public in using its capabilities to assist the Ukrainian government. And it has been encouraged to do so obviously by the US government. I think that we are going to see, uh, no matter what happens in the Ukraine, uh, a much more public and high level discussion about what government regulations are of the private sector in cybersecurity. Now, as academics, it's easy for us to jump to the conclusion, well, of course, there should be more government regulation. And there'd be a lot of uh, agreement to some extent within the business sector. But what they are very worried about is that government regulations, and I can speak to this as of somebody who was in charge of regulation that dealt with the security of US global networks, is often very slow and often uh, not capable of really dealing with evolving practices rapidly. It's not totally stupid. And when people say government is totally behind the ball, they're wrong, but there are limits to what the government can do. And the private sector has to have the ability to improvise and to do what they think best on their individual circumstances. So balancing regulatory control and private initiative and discretion is a very hard thing to get right, but this is going to be a big factor in the future. And I'll close by just simply asking uh, a question that you might all have in the back of your mind. When you deal with business or you deal with university uh, networks, how secure are we? And the answer is, we don't actually know. Uh, as I've indicated to you, we're much more secure than we were 10 years ago. But as the head uh, cybersecurity person for one of the most famous digital tech companies uh, said to Stefan Savage in Computer Science and Me uh, this winter, we don't even know how to measure success. So we can't actually give you a scorecard. And on top of it, if you can't measure uh, I, for your results, you're driven to other things such as looking at best practices and looking at are you following what's considered to be best practices? And he said the problem with best practices, of course, is that they, like everything else, are often 
one step behind. So we live in a world where the risk remains that's considerable, but in fact, the Ukraine war is in some ways an encouraging one for those of us who believe that cyber tools are going to be a permanent part of cyber military uh, and national security doctrines, that we are going to have to live with these uh, uses of cyber and war in the future, but that maybe it's not as bad as we once worried. And with that, let me open the floor to questions or comments. Thank you, Peter. That was terrific. And we really, uh, and I anticipate a lot of um, interesting questions. Um, so folks, just uh, raise your hand and uh, uh, <clears throat> Suzanne will be watching for that and uh, alerting us to people who have a question. Uh, and some of you may want to put those questions in the uh, chat. Uh, and I see one from um, Christine Humfeld here. How does the piracy logic work out on the Russian side? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so um, let's go back to analogy uh, for a moment because it's new territory. Um, the uh, when the British really uh, were at the forefront of establishing uh, piracy as a major uh, augmentation of its uh, capability in dealing with the Spanish Empire, which at the time was more important and more powerful than the British, um, you know, the Spanish finally responded by authorizing their own privateers. Mm -hmm. So um, it wouldn't be surprising for the Russians to try to do this, but they have a problem. And the problem is that the uh, extraordinary authoritarian measures that have consolidated uh, uh, Russian government influence over uh, their primary, uh, more capable uh, corporate actors uh, makes it harder to pull this off. Does it make it impossible? No. So Russian privateers in the future? Maybe. How about this instead? Maybe friendly states to Russia, the couple of uh, East European countries where they have sway like Belarus uh, start to charter uh, in a sense pirates as well. Um, new space, new possibilities. I would just say harder for the Russians than for the Ukrainians, but not impossible. Thank you. Barbara Parker, followed by John Wheeler. Uh, yes, Peter, wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Um, what led to Biden's new approach of intelligence uh, forward? <clears throat> Was it his personal beliefs, an event that previously happened, or advice from the intelligence community? Very good question. Um, so, um, I've served uh, two Democratic presidents <laughs> in office, uh, so my political leanings are uh, pretty transparent. But I, but I would say that this is a case where you've got to say that the uh, military intelligence community in general uh, held pretty true to itself uh, from the period in Obama where this started to escalate as an area of, intel, of concern through the Trump administration uh, and now into Biden. And so this has been an evolving doctrine over this time. Now with strategy evolving, so is the debate over how to organize uh, cyber uh, capabilities in the government. And this should be a, a point uh, of careful watch uh, I know it's been debated inside the Biden administration, uh, which is that we have done two things. First, uh, during Trump, we escalated the cyber war command into being a full military command like the Army and the Air Force. And by now, this is, a, I think, accepted as having been a good decision. The second thing that happened over this span of time I'm describing is the decision that the National Security Agency, which is 
the crown jewel of US intelligence uh, capability in the digital realm. And the military cyber command should be dual headed. And by dual headed, we mean one person holds both commands. So the head of the NSA and the head of cyber command are both a general. In this case, Paul Nakasone, who gets good marks from, from people for his leadership roles. But this fusion of the two is something that for the viewpoint of civilian accountability and control is something to be watched as it goes forward. Um, in general, I would say that uh, uh, then that what is newer with Biden, and this really bears Biden's imprint, is his uh, determination with his national security team to engage this idea of, for, of strategic diplomacy, uh, opening up uh, sources and know-how if necessary in order to do the diplomacy. Uh, Trump was, as you know, a complete haphazard story on diplomacy, uh, most of it more hazard than hap. And uh, the um, level of sophistication of the Biden team and how they've used cyber intelligence in this case is really a mark of somebody who's been around the block and has good people around him. Will they make an error or two here? They might, uh, but so far, I think they deserve very high credit. Thank you. John Wheeler, followed by Barbara. John, unmute yourself. First of all, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I, I, the question I want to ask is based solely on news reporting which may be more or less reliable. But my impression from some news reports I've heard is that the Russian troops in Ukraine were using uh, communication methods that the Ukrainians were able to de listen to. <laughs> and so it led me to wonder, was it in fact the case that part of the reason that, they, that Russia did not do more cyber attacks on Ukraine is they needed the Ukrainian communication uh, apparatus in order to communicate with each other. Well, thanks for raising a, a delicious uh, fact. Uh, the, uh, it is true. Uh, and the reporting in the New York Times has been exemplary on uh, these matters, uh, especially David Sanger, um, that, uh, the Ukrainians uh, amplified some misfires by the Russians themselves by bringing down uh, part of uh, the networks in a way that uh, the Russians had to use um, uh, Ukrainian cell phones. Uh, now this speaks to the command and control coordination within the Russian military. And that certainly opened up access for intelligence gathering, not just by the US, but the Ukrainians have a very good intelligence gathering operation and they fully took advantage of this. But you've got to distinguish that, the source of ready intelligence because the Russian army was not well set up for their own communications networks to uh, the issue of uh, the launching of botnets for ma malware, et cetera. That is a very, uh, sophisticated and separate exercise. And the stories of the cell phone towers and the use of local Ukrainian cell phones does not have much to do with that. Uh -huh. So the Russians could still do their attacks. What has been surprising is how good the defense has been against these attacks. Now, there's probably more the Russians could do. Uh, again, Chris Inglis said, you know, the Russians probably held back a little bit because they expected an easier victory. And I think we should take that seriously. Maybe I can use this as a footnote to tell you all that when you assess people saying that we're at risk of attack from the Russians in the United States on cybersecurity, I've given you a somewhat optimistic statement, 
But there are plenty of vulnerabilities in the United States. Uh, and an example is the electric grid. The easiest place to take out the electric grid in the United States is at the local level. The substations coming in and off of the main transmission lines and the local distribution system. Those are not as well protected as the backbone uh, generating and transmission system. And it's going to be hard to fix that problem easily because the entire national grid of the United States is old and needs to be upgraded against things like storms and earthquakes, et cetera. And the bill, according to the National Academy of Engineering, is going to be staggering. And cyber is just one of many expenditures against that risk profile. So we have lots of spots at the edge of our networks that can be points of real problems in the future. But the picture is brighter. Thank you. Barbara Brody? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter. It was a fantastic presentation. I'd like to ask a question that may be so off the subject that you don't want to respond. But I'm wondering I don't know. <laughs> what, what you think the Chinese may have learned from this. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I think the, uh, the Chinese have, uh, you know, been studying the same lessons that we have. Uh, they're certainly there and present uh observing through their own cyber surveillance mechanisms uh and so i think that that has uh come through i think that uh we can conclude that if china should actually get into the use of cyber for if you would a kinetic purpose maybe not a full pearl harbor but something nasty that they would have a much more carefully engineered and precise plan than uh, the Russians had because of the reassessment of defensive capabilities. So that's, I think, one lesson that they'll draw. I think that the lesson that, frankly, both the US and China and everyone else with real military capacity is trying to draw is uh, what do we make about uh, the intersection of cyber and conventional military capabilities for the future of war. Um, you know, part of the story that I didn't dwell on is that the Ukraine has used cyber intelligence, both their own, which is pretty good, and augment it with information from the US and the UK in particular to really uh, have a much more sophisticated command and control targeting system and deployment of forces strategy uh, than uh, the Russians ever anticipated. And in fact, much more sophisticated than is typical in most conf conflicts. And that has intersected with a second uh, development, which is not cyber, but which is uh, related to digital in general, which is the rise of a new generation of much more sophisticated uh, weapons, uh, drones, if you would, uh, the use of sophisticated anti-tank systems, et cetera. And all of those are enabled by the fact that the targeting and uh, detection systems guiding the use of these weapons means that you no longer have to lay down entire artillery barrages to knock something out. You can much more precisely target and deliver attacks uh, on military capacity of the enemy. That's the problem that the Russians have had. For example, there's a, a, a study from uh, one of the British military service institutes that says that Russian tanks, despite the fact you've seen them all blown up in these pictures that you get, uh, are actually pretty well armored. And if you hit them from the front with a, uh, uh, an attack, they're likely to withstand the attack. But what is occurring is that with much more precise targeting from weapons that are essentially portable and uh, launched from a distance with remote targeting, 
is that the tanks are being hit on the side. And because of where their ammunition rests inside the tank, a side attack on the tank is much more dangerous to a tank than a frontal assault. So the rise of precision weapons tied to digital surveillance and intelligence is changing the nature of battlefield dynamics. You'll recall that when uh, the Russian cruiser was taken out by Ukrainian uh, land-based uh, missiles, um, there was much joy, you know, gleeful. All oh, the Russians have had their come ups in, in the naval realm. Uh, it's important to note that what the Ukrainians did to the Russians, there was a lot of war gaming going on in the US to figure out, could the Chinese do that to the US fleet, mm -hmm. right? Um, the first response of the Navy uh, quite predictably is, oh no, we've got that covered. We figured out how to cover you know, and protect. Um, is it right? I think there's gonna be a lot of thinking about that. Now, there's one other footnote to this which is the Russians lost the cruiser, but they still control in naval terms, the Black Sea. So individual successes in combat against particular units is not the same as a strategic battlefield control, right? And so all this is going to be reassessed. And I'm sure the Chinese are vigorously doing that just as we are. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Rose followed by Jake Jacoby. Yeah, thank you very much. I was just curious, you know, we've gotten a lot of airplay about Elon Musk's uh, <clears throat> satellite server system that has been used. Right. I just want to my comment and has that really made a difference, uh, both in Ukraine and uh, in general with cyber uh, consideration? Yeah, so first of all, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it has made a difference for the Ukrainians. Uh, there were a lot of satellites that provided redundant uh, uh, communications networks. And this goes to the point of risk management, which is we want to have redundant systems and key infrastructure so that at least uh, partial capacity can always be maintained. And uh, the uh, uh, Musk uh, corporate capacity in its satellite uh, Starlink system has been very valuable apparently. Now, the second point that probably should be uh, tied to this is that the, um, the needs of the military are often uh, not just stuff you can back up easily from the civilian in full. And so there's a lot of work being done right now in the United States in both the R&D community and in the military systems thinkers about how you can better use the land civilian uh, communications networks that we're installing today, particularly 5G uh, networks securely by US forces when operating in other countries. Uh, and that is a technical challenge that uh, can't be just fixed by waving your hand at Musk satellites. Uh, but there are ways of thinking about doing this. So, um, it's a space to be watched, if you don't mind the pun. And how translatable is it outside of military conflict in Ukraine to other uh, disasters, such as the big tsunami that occurred in the South Pacific? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an area dear to my heart, because I used to be in charge of regulating U.S. satellite systems. We are finally getting to what we thought uh, might happen in the late 1990s and early 2000s with truly enormous swaths of satellites in place around the world, providing overlapping communications and observation systems everywhere uh, at low cost, uh, really on a global basis. And uh, those systems that were launched, and I signed the authorization order for a couple of them, uh, all failed. They were before their time technologically and they just couldn't pull it off uh, on an economic basis and technologically even in, in any convincing way. But we seem to have it now. 
And this is going to be enormously valuable for civilian purposes and also for providing a low cost, ubiquitous broadband capacity in every corner of the world. Nothing fixes everything totally, but this is a big step forward to helping with these problems. Thank you. Jake Jacoby, followed by Ron. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I was wondering if is Taiwan as cyber secure savvy as Ukraine is, are they more prone to greater damage from a Pearl Harbor attack, say from China, than Ukraine was from Russia? Uh, never fear for the Taiwanese capacity in digital. It's quite formidable. It may not be uh, Israel, which is one of the uh, digital uh, cyber security superpowers, uh, but they are very good. Uh, their problems are more kinetic, if you would, that the Chinese are just over the horizon with enormous physical capacity. Uh, but I think that the Taiwanese, we can have confidence, are pretty well set up. Thank you. Ron Kemp now. Yeah. Um, when I worked at UCSD, I had a boss that went on to work at SAIC, and he said, um, they've been able to trace um, attempted hacks to military in China. Uh, can you discuss differentiating between the bad actors, you know, in the military versus, you know, some of the incidents we had locally, like at Scripps, right. you know, where they're, they're trying to ransom. It seems like we have, um, bad actors uh, on maybe both components, uh, pri you know, uh, criminals versus military, but they're both doing bad things. Right. Uh, well, I'm glad you raised that issue. Uh, I didn't want to go wandering over the whole cyber landscape in this talk, but it's, uh, it's important to note this capacity, if you would, of the private criminal sector. And um, uh, here the news is pretty depressing for the use of uh, cyber for criminal activities. It's depressing in the sense that um, unlike for military security purposes where you have a notion of a motivated mar uh, actor with uh, targeting priorities, et cetera, the criminal group is just looking for a buck. So, uh, where the targeting is going to take place is much more ubiquitous. Uh, and uh, the damage that can be inflicted uh, doesn't have to be gigantic in order for it to be very profitable. Now, having said that, let me just tell you about how sophisticated the uh, private uh, criminal world of cyber is. If you went on to the dark web today, you could find with a little bit of searching the equivalent of eBay for cyber attack weapons. And when I say the equivalent of eBay, I mean it looks like eBay. And on it, you can uh, find and bid to purchase all sorts of attack capabilities for cyber crime. You can order it up, combine it. There are even consumer ratings by other attackers reporting how good the tool was, right? This is very serious stuff and it is highly proliferated. So um, that said, cyber criminals have various levels of sensitivity. For example, cyber criminals have by and large gotten out of anything tied to child, child pornography uh, and using their tools to help child pornography. Just too risky in their viewpoint it's one thing that really gets government and law enforcement to put in major efforts to go after them. Um, a lot of them are starting to pull back from attacks on things like hospital systems, but it's clearly not uniform. But again, they, they do cost benefit analysis. You can even go and you will discover that uh, on this call, certainly, most of us have at least some piece of our information that is on a list that a cyber criminal can uh, 
have access to buy. Um, it doesn't mean that you're insecure. A, you're not that relevant individually. And, and B, uh, the information itself may not be complete enough to allow for a cyber attack. But you accumulate it, you correlate it, and you know you put it together. Uh, but here's here's the thing: um, those lists of you know digital identity information pieces, they're priced so that the cost of information on a person living in California is something like 20x the price uh, for the information on people living in Thailand. It's a rational marketplace. So are we going to continue to have trouble in this area? Yes. Uh, uh, are we going to get better on defense? Yes. Uh, is the problem going to go away? Does crime ever go away? No, it doesn't. So we're going to be there. But I, I would say back up all your personal data into the cloud. Yeah, good advice. Thank you. Anything else? Well, it looks like we've sort of reached the point where uh, we've uh, shown the limits of what I know. Oh, we have one more, do I see? Ah, two more. Two more, sorry. No, yeah, two more, sorry. They, they just went up. So Steve Rose, can you unmute? Yep, I just did. The, um, so it's, as you pointed out, so much of the, uh, uh, the kinetic war that's going on in Ukraine has to do with uh, improved targeting that is all electronic, if you will, to guide the missiles into the side of the tanks, for example. It seemed uh, that in the in the reconnaissance with the with the drones and whatnot that so much of this information is basically ele electronic transmitted through the uh, the airwaves, if you would. Is there a capability of completely uh, blanketing or wiping out either satellites or uh, somehow putting up a shield so that that would get all of those capabilities to get blocked out and you're having to look through a gun sight again? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and there may be something cooking that's classified that I have no idea about, but the best of my knowledge, that's an improbable scenario. Uh, the one thing that would allow you to do it for uh, the short term is something you don't want to do, which is use uh, an EMP, an electromagnetic uh, pulse, which is uh, most easily set off by a low-yield nuclear weapon, uh, which will wipe out most of the electronics that uh, would be tied there. Uh, the military takes that risk sufficiently seriously that for certain capacities, for example, on aircraft carriers, they are shielded against EMP pulses. Um, and uh, uh, But it would take out everything uh, that was unshielded, and it would involve a nuke or some other pretty uh, significant other source of energy to set off such a pulse. And I don't know enough about the state of the art physics to know if there's a substitute for a small nuke for doing it. Christine, you had another question? Yes, Peter, thank you for a wonderful informative presentation. Um, I was wondering, I mean, from what you were saying, it sounds, it might be a political risky question that uh, the US is basically on the defensive side. I mean, trying to avoid any kind of attacks from Russia or from somewhere else. But is there an active involvement of the US in providing some uh, attack on Russian uh, systems? I mean, how actively involved is the US in really diminishing the impact of the Ukraine, of the Russians in Ukraine? Well, that's a fair question. And it's one where the fog of war is really foggy. Um, uh, the Biden administration has declared that it is not helping uh, uh, the targeting of certain Russian capacity. A, any 
capacity of Russia that is physically in Russia, and B, certain classes of Russian uh, capacity in the Ukraine, and most notably uh, the uh, generals that have been knocked off uh, in uh, the Ukraine uh, by uh, and killed. Uh, that we say we didn't provide any targeting information in that relationship. So we're clearly trying to set some claims about the limits of where we're helping the Ukraine in getting um, intelligence to help their battle effort. But we buttress that by a second claim, which is that we don't ever talk with the Ukraines about their actual choice of implementing decisions with the intelligence, that's up to them. Now, you can believe that or not. Um, I'm sure that as a matter of doctrine, it may be true, but what we know from the studies that have come out of applied in use of intelligence, digital intelligence and military systems is people gotta talk to each other. And when talking to each other, it's not so clear that all those lines are always finally watched. But it may not be a matter of policy, and it may be the exception, not the rule, but it could be happening. Um, the other part of this in the fog of war is whether the US has done anything on a forward basis to disrupt some of the potential Russian cyber attacks against the Ukraine operating in Russia. And if we have, and I'm not saying that we have at all, but if we have, that would stay as darkly and deeply wrapped up as we could keep it. Uh, and so I think that this is the stuff of spy novels at the moment, not of informed commentary. Roger? Wonderful talk, fascinating, thank you. And if this is too tangential, save the answer for uh, another time. I'm wondering if there's strategies under development for communicating with a population to counter disinformation, perhaps in the Russian population, perhaps a modern analog of Voice of America. Right. Um, so this goes back to nothing is entirely new. Uh, if you read uh, the memoirs of Russian, of I should say British cabinet members uh, and of uh, the German uh, leadership during World War II, you will see that there was active discussion about propaganda as an important strategic tool. Uh, and at least some members of the German leadership really thought that their propaganda efforts would convince uh, the British to negotiate rather than fight. Uh, so this is always on the table in a conflict. And cyber means that the ways of penetrating are greater in some respects in, than in the past. Uh, that said, um, the Russians control most of the means of uh, broadcast communication. Uh, you can say, well, satellites could beam it down, but you need a satellite dish or a receiver on the other side, uh, and there are ways that the police can deal with that. Um, you could say, oh, well, you can deliver it via encrypted uh, uh, internet services over uh, Telegram or whatever. And there is some of that, but it's remarkably little uh, as a mass impact uh, undertaking. Now, um, I highly recommend that if you want to follow somebody from the UCSD faculty on Facebook for his postings on this war, you follow uh, one of our members of political science, Bronislav uh, Slanchev. Not only is Bronislav uh, a very renowned game theorist on security matters, uh, but he is also grew up in Eastern Europe, has family back there uh, in Bulgaria. And as he reports to us ruefully, he can't get his parents to believe what we know about the Ukraine. Um, so um, yeah, you can always hope. 
uh, and try. And it may be that if uh, the long-term cost of sanctions is sustained, and there's a pretty good chance they will be, and they are costly in the long term. They can't stop the Russians, but they can make it very costly. Uh, that maybe more and more of the, if you would, digital least sophisticated elites will start searching for those alternative means of uh, information. And that might change things uh, to some degree. But I, I'm not a big optimist on this uh, topic, uh, at least in the short term. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think the volume of questions has uh, showed how you've stirred our thinking and, and uh, our curiosity about this area. And we're very grateful uh, again to your to your uh, being with us and, and st sticking with all the, the questions. So uh, thank you. And uh, I remind you that we'll be off for the summer for this series, but uh, return again in September, I believe. So um, look for those announcements. Okay. Thanks all for listening.